Hello, I'm Peter Blackwood. I'm coordinator of the Uniting Church in Australia's Icon Schools. Each year, Philip Davidov and Olga Shalomova from St. Petersburg, two contemporary Russian iconographers, visit Melbourne and conduct classes. This year, in January uh, 2019, the Icon Schools invited uh, Philip and Olga to spend an afternoon with us and they generously uh, provided uh, a, a wonderful uh, program of lecture and demonstration. In this first chapter of uh, the lecture that Philip Davidov from St Petersburg gave, uh, he deals with the uh, development of iconography uh, through uh, its history, particularly up to the time of Peter the Great and, and, and beyond, and the development that uh, uh, occurred in Russian art uh, during the revolution. I asked Peter what could be the most interesting, most I don't know, urgent topic to speak about, and he said somehow that mainly that could be the point of interest between the time when we consider iconography as something medieval and the time when iconography becomes contemporary in the sense of more westernized, as the Russians used to say, with influence by Peter the Great. And I started investigating and I discovered lots of things which I didn't know. <laughs> because, okay, everybody loves seeing this picture of well, a certain assumption. Uh, uh, I don't know what's the name of this feast in English, Pokrava, the the Holy Veil of the Man of God, yes, Nerl, which was built as one of by one of first kings of Russia, of princes, inspired by Byzantine, by curved, by German artists. And there always used to be some common influence from the West towards Russia, since we used to be a kingdom always communicated with Western countries. We had lots of trades, and in the end, I would say it had changed our approach even to the iconography. Well, let, let's start moving. And I'm happy to show, well, unfortunately, the size of the screen is not really huge. I used to have something bigger. We should try thinking of this space of the church as dedicated mostly to the situation when everybody comes here to focus in prayer and rather to be with yourself or in front of an image but not to admire any terrestrial beauty presented to you. In first churches, we do have some gilded details, but not so many. The iconostasis you would encounter in 12th or 13th century church would mostly be cons would consist of just shelves, where you put icons on top, and the shelves decorated with colors or some very light gilding. The icons we have in the first centuries were quite simplistic compared to what we will encounter later time, but I would rather say that simplicity was intentional decision of these artists because they tried to focus the attention of the beholder rather in prayer than in some external beautiness of the figures represented. Therefore, these first icons are much more sober and much more essential than something what we see later. But history moved on, and we know that there were different words, different influences, and step by step, somehow, maybe having, I don't know, members of the royal families, marrying other members of the royal families, and bringing forth from different countries, things started to change. And we know that many builders and carvers were invited to Russia from many Western countries, and they brought their new patterns, and of course, new for Russia, first of all. And they brought their approach to the shape. And instead of having something very simply made from point of view of external form and very essentially built as from point of view of integrity of the volume, we start seeing buildings, even church buildings, enriched by lots of decoration. 
Mahmud side would also mean that people wanted some more decorative motifs inside. And that was happening much long before Peter the Great. We can speak about the 16th and 17th century movement in this direction. And these were the churches, not in Moscow as capital, but in Yaroslav, for example, or some other provincial places where people were more free, maybe, or decided to have something more flourishing rather than more essential what they had in the beginning of what they had previously. Like having the new car more decorative, more decorative than the older one. The new church be more beautiful than the older one. And this movement and evolvement touches the whole country. Yes, some cities were more famous for that and they had particular teams of artists painting these frescoes and icons. And I'm presenting a part of the church in Yaroslav which, if we consider to the one of the first images I've shown, is much richer in quantity of figures, amount of their gestures, positions, how they're placed in the architecture. Imagery becomes like a carpet covering the whole surface of architecture, not so much obeying it, but rather decorating the space. And this process of some people say flourishing of iconography because as soap operas invite much more many actors and actresses to play roles and to work. The same happens here. The new churches required more work, more iconographers and more special skills to be applied to. We not only talk about the paintings applied on the walls, but also about the icon stand or iconostasis, which used to be the main focusing point, the main part of the visual uh, vestments of the church. So we start seeing details of this earlier made, like just simple shells, being always more and more decorated, being more and more gilded and more and more three dimensional. Some sources say that this new kind of fashion would be called Flemish type of carving because Flemish masters were maybe invited to one church building and they started to like building, decorating other ones. But I want you to notice how the new appearance of the frames starts conditioning the way the images are made as well. So the environment is conditioning how the artist is working. Some churches were painted all over, some churches were left pure white, but even the pure white churches try to count how far would this iconosis go to the height. So it's maybe like eight-story building, something very tall. Mm -hmm. And of course, there were not only visual developments, but this went together simultaneously with the process of a constant change of the liturgy, of course, an approach of the priesthood to what the liturgy should have been proceeded like. So the very role of the rite, the very perception of the rite started, well, was constantly changing. And I'm not sure that being a good liturgist, about the time when a very important part of the liturgy started becoming the hidden part. Because the beauty of the choir, supposedly giving much more, I don't know, what's the word, and the word is satisfaction, much more enjoyment to the lay people standing in the church, or staying there, staying for hours in the church, became more attractive and important than really the very content of the rite <coughs> and the prayer said by the priest. So this thing was reflected in the iconos. I can't say that the iconos went first and the rite went second. I think these two things were together because the priesthood kept 
more and more or starts becoming more and more separate from the humans, from lay people, and that was the world dividing them and substituting the ability to see the mysteries happening in the altar with the representations of saints and technically citizens of heaven. So these are portraits of citizens of heaven suggested to people to pray with instead of a more full participation in the rite, which probably was not considered to be so uh, so good to be given to everybody or to be shown to everybody since that was the most sacred part of the life. So, so there are many churches remaining from the older times, some of them get restored, but from what we have currently in our country, I would say 90 or 80 and something percent was destroyed. So these very little and very few pieces which we can admire in several old churches and old towns and cities are little pieces. So, and one more time, I speak to try to see how traditional item being surrounded, being framed by this three dimensional and almost baroque carvings and gilded environment doesn't properly work, doesn't fit the space. And therefore we can start speaking about the iconosis, even before Peter the Great, slightly changing the images as well. So the external side was evolving as well as internal, even before Peter. And we can say that this process went more or less simultaneously in most of the cities, since people were traveling and bringing the new movements, new ideas to their villages and little towns. And that's what probably it would look like before the time Peter's come to the stage. So what he saw were not the items by Andrei Rublev or other famous now, very, I don't know, talented and spiritually serious iconographers of the past, but by his time, religious images, what he saw, looked like that. So it was something rather reminding a stage of theater with lots of gold in the decoration instead of the spirituality in which these images used to be in the past. And of course, comparing icons like this, painted in the 13th century, even copies made of it, even copies made of it, similar ones, will look much more different. Because the brain of the iconographer would have been different at the moment. Even trying to be faithful to the model, he or she who would paint an icon like that would represent it in a totally different way. We see more gold, we see more humanness in the approach and the way the images represent. So, on the first place, it's a Vladimir Skaya and a very traditional one. But looking more carefully, you understand that there is much more blush on the cheeks. And the cheeks are more three-dimensional, are more attractive and human if we compare it from, with the old one. So, things become more and more externalized, not with influence of Peter the Great, but simply because the life in the country is not an autonomous life. It gets always influences from people coming from other countries and feeling that that has to change because of the time of change. So technically, yes, we have all the features regular for an icon, the hood, the special ribbon around it, but the face expression is changing, the, the approach of someone who is building it up is changing as well. And that's what we can say, speaking about the ancient trash maker. We don't know which is the ancient, well, probably the ancient is, like, let's speak, till the 14th century. But then it's under Rublev, 
then it's someone who wants to make Andrew's work more beautiful, and then more and more and more. So it's always maybe towards the more, more beautiful. I don't know, more human, more coming close to the beholder. And at some point, in the 18th century, we start seeing things like this, which try to represent iconography of traditional type in approach of a Western painting. Mm -hmm. So that's how slightly shifting the perspective and the ways of painting certain details, the iconographers interpreted their subject differently. And again, from first glance, it's a very traditional, flat, and abstracted image of Saint Serge of Radonezh. But looking at the way the iconographer treated the hands and the face, we'll see it's almost a photograph. It's almost a realistic painting, even done with the uh, tools of an iconographer. It's a very interesting collision an involvement which happened in it. And one of the most famous artists of the time, which I always forget the name, <laughs> oh yeah, what is Simon it? Simon Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Simon, or Simon in Russian transcription, Ushakov. And he's famous because he worked for Tren Moscow, he worked for the Tsar's family, he did a lot. And we know he did really work before Peter the Great. So it's not Peter's blame that he's painted his icons more realistically. It's just because his time and the fashion, sorry, I have to use the word, mm -hmm. and the inquiries of people were changing the attitude. So this is one of his icons, and here is another one. So it's almost a realistic painting already in many aspects except for the composition and other set of things which may look different. So it's almost what we have in Peter the Great time and what most of our parish attendants of our time would prefer having instead of seeing icons of the 12th century. So it's something more contemporary, even for people of our time, and it would be much more preferred by them, since they recognize the human face better. They feel more attracted to more realistic image, rather than to one made in an abstracted way. And this is still the son of Nushakov's work, and I just wanted to bring forward what was happening before Peter the Great. And I can change, I can evolve, I can flourish in order to become, to, to come towards heroes. And maybe because the clients were now not only the kings inviting special masters from Greece or uh, Georgia or some other Orthodox ancient countries, but these were <coughs> simple merchants or merchants gathering together and asking their fellow iconographer to paint something for them, something touching their souls, but not extraordinarily ancient. And this is a piece of a Yaroslav painting, and I just want to draw your attention to how the artist is treating the folds and the figures. We can actually compare it to a photograph made in a commercial center. So there are no more hierarchically placed in a sacred space somewhere. They're much more alive, interacting between each other, and not so stiff as an image in the icon used to be. So they are interacting within this very sacred scene, and I think it's, I don't know, I think it's feeding of 5,000 with five notes, but I may be wrong. I'm not sure, maybe, the wedding in Kana, but again, it's some very traditional representation, which used to be more, yeah, okay, more canonical, as we say, or more stiff, is if that were to be done in an early time. 
And the image of Mother of God, of course, is shifting as well. It's changing to have a more flourishing look, which would very much remind us of Italian Madonnas, which would have lots of people around the Mother of God and her showing like, protection and the people showing their respect. And the image I'm showing now was not painted by Simon Ushakov, but this is another a very interesting thing we've had in our history of iconography. We had entire villages in the central part of Russia, not far from Moscow, which didn't have very good soil. So their specialization was rather to paint an icon, and they have this icon production entire villages. Like, my team would consist of 10 people, and one person would be doing the general outline, the other would be doing the faces, the third would be doing the fold with the red, the fifth will be doing the mountains, and so forth. So, it's a kind of industrial production, and they were bringing these items and carriages to Moscow and selling them in bulk quantities. So this is actually Palek, which we know as a production, for its production of Palek lab boxes, but that's how everything started. They used to produce images even a long time before the revolution, looking as if that were an illustration for a fairy tale, or something highly decorative, and yet supposed to be, supposedly sacred. So these are images produced by Palek just before the revolution. We're, we have to make several like, I know, shifts and jumps in this lecture because it's easier to connect certain events and styles. So that's what they had before the revolution, but when everything happened, they had dozens of artists who knew how to paint and to paint by decorative. So what they had to do after revolution, I don't know, cleaning streets, it was a little town, they didn't, have, didn't need so many people cleaning the streets. So they just shifted their skills and started producing images very similarly looking from formal point of view, but with a different type of content. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they do produce them by now, I think there are several even generations of coming one after another, they know perfect, I know proportions, and even make better than you do how to mix the egg or something else and to paint the highlights from the mountains, but the goal is different. So the tools are the same, the way of building the volume and space in the image the same, but just shifted the main characters. These are no more humans of medieval time. They are now the contemporary humans having contemporary, I don't know, lives and the characters. So these are very famous and they are very much stylized simply because that's the way these guys used to paint and used to present their images. Hmm? How about that? These ones which I've encountered quite prepared in this lecture. So it's, if we take this face away, we see how iconic are the highlights and shadows.